So what do you want to do today, Amy? I've watched a couple of your episodes. I like it. Uh-huh. I can't cook, but I enjoy uh, cooking shows. I did a bit Oh, you can't cook? Okay. Not at all. Zero. <laughs> I know I, people like you. I know. <laughs> I've lived with people like yeah. you. <laughs> sure. Huh? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's okay, though. But I've sort of made my way. I did a bit of research into why foods are sexy. Why, mm-hmm. like specifically ketogenics, specifically in sexual health and vitality, a little bit of the history of how foods are sexy, and then specifically looking at why food is so important to overall health and vitality, like specifically ketogenic type food. So I did a made sure I had a lot of my facts straight. I'm good with the food stuff, but it's a little bit out of my bandwidth. So I made sure I did quite a bit of research to get ready for you. Well, we don't have to only play in my playground. We can do it in yours as well. I am. Any playground is good. Any playground is good. So when you were saying I've been studying, I did a little bit of background and then you went into the yeah. keto sexy stuff. I thought, yeah. oh my gosh, you did a little bit of background on me and I oh, started no. panicking for a moment. I'd like to know who I'm talking with. I'm a little bit new to the world of, well, I'm very new to the world of podcasting. I actually took it up as a sort of a tool to help me get better at public speaking. I have been a lecturer for 30 years in traditional medical lectures, but that is very different than public speaking. I had this sort of random offer for a podcast a few months ago, and I thought it was a good exercise. So I'm really much enjoying meeting really cool people like yourself who are people I would not meet otherwise. So it's really exciting. So I did a little research on you a little bit. Oh, good, good. It's always nice to know who you're speaking with. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it's really quite possible, Amy Gutman, that some of your overnight, I guess you do ER, right? You're an ER physician. It's really quite possible that some of the patients you've had over the years whose balls I've busted and whose asses I've kicked and that you probably nurse them back to health. I probably do a lot more ass kicking than nurturing some nights. Actually, one of the reasons that I've got into this is because about 85% of the people that I see are there because of chronic disease and lifestyle choices. And unfortunately, I'll have 50 patients a night. I can't really sit and do a lot of handholding. And it's very frustrating to me because if they knew more about food and nutrition, they wouldn't end up in my emergency department. Uh, we all, I mean, it's Florida. So we always have, you know, hold my beer and watch this as one right. does. But That's really how I started kind of going a little bit to the left of traditional medicine and trying to figure out how to deal with my frustration in not being able to fix problems. I'm sure with your background, knowing like I grew up, I I thought margarine was healthy. I'm sure as a chef that makes your head explode. Yeah, yeah, the back of it it has exploded I know, I know. Mm -hmm. And I... um, So I didn't know any of these things. I knew nothing. I'm like, I thought nothing about having cereal three times a day because I can't cook. And, oh, soy milk is so much healthier and we know it's not. And so when I learned these things, and I didn't think I was a horrible doctor, but I've been telling patients for years, I'm like, oh, you got to have a you know, low fat diet, low fat diet. And it's, it's just ultimately one of the worst things that you can do for people. So now I'm kind of trying to make reparations for that. I'm trying to, this is my penance. Not that speaking with you is a penance, of course. I don't mean it that way. This is torture, I know. It's horrible. It's horrible. Uh Actually, my husband is laughing because he he wanted to stay and listen, but he had to pick up our, our son from school. He's like, he goes, yes, he goes, please, not too sexy. He goes, you're an older woman, not too sexy. I'm like, all right. So, like, what's this whole thing about picking up the kid at school? I used to walk, you know, five miles uphill to school and five miles uphill to get back home when I was With milk pills. With milk pills, right? Right. Yeah. No parents had to pick me up. No, absolutely. No, I grew up in Detroit. I grew up in Detroit. We just dodged gunfire where I grew up. We didn't didn't have hills. Just gunfire. Is Gutman your maiden name? Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. I was too cheap to change it. 
Are you a member of the tribe? I am a member of the tribe. Absolutely. Knew it. Absolutely. Knew it. Okay. Yeah, I, I had a feeling. Hair color, red or blonde, what works for you better? What do you like better? And is there any sort of dialogue that goes along with your hair color? So grew up as a redhead, turned gray. And now I'm in that weird, I'm gray, but every time I go outside, it's Florida, it turns weird. But I grew up a redhead and my husband is Irish Catholic. So he has the sort of red hair as well. And our poor child has the combination of the Jufro and weird coloration. Mm -hmm. And the internal monologue of being uh, a redheaded person is um, probably exactly what you think it is. There's sometimes very little internal monologue. It just, how about yourself? Are you a, a red or blonde or in between? Oh, for, for myself? Yes. It is what it is. It's never changed. I never played around with color and, and all mm -hmm. of that. Yeah. As far as my perception of you, I think you look great as a blonde, but I've seen photographs you. of you as a redhead. I have been red and I, it, during COVID, I kind of gave up. I was living in Bermuda and uh, you couldn't get any hair dye whatsoever. And I'm like, you know what? I'd already started to go gray. Let it go gray. And then weirdly enough, it went in that weird sort of gray blonde. And mm -hmm. that's where I am now. Your husband is an Irish Catholic and you're a nice Very Jewish much. girl. So that yes. means your, your child is Jewish. Yes. Do we, yes. do we utilize any religious techniques in bringing him up? We call it the Big Ten. Uh -huh. So in our house, we do the Big Ten because we share the Big Ten. And it's like... He knows he's Jewish. He is raised and we just, we raised him in faith. And when we got married, we had a late Catholic minister and a rabbi. And we promised we're like, wherever he goes, we're happy. We know he's Jewish. We just want to raise him in faith and understanding that there is a higher power and he's going to be welcome everywhere, which he has been very much so. And he's 15. He's um, autistic. He's amazing. But he has some questions that it's a really interesting thing to see how his perception of his place in that faith universe is. Uh, it's a very interesting, interesting conversation. You know, growing up as, as a young guy, he's 15. So he was, you know, 11 or so when COVID began. Yes. That must have really messed him up. And uh, like it, it messed everybody up, but how yes. has he responded to that, especially being on the spectrum? So it was actually really interesting because I had moved to my dream job in Bermuda. I was running the pre-hospital care system in it for an entire country and a physician there, but I moved there a week and a half before COVID started. He and my husband were supposed to join me when the school year finished. And two weeks later, of course, the world exploded. And it was six months, seven months before I saw them again, unfortunately, because everything wow. just shut. Right. And but coming to, I know, become, coming to Bermuda was wonderful for him because it was a small island. It was closed. But we found a fantastic school for him that managed to stay open. It had very strict restriction. But when you live on an island that's 21 miles long... Everybody knows everybody. You become very dependent on your neighbors and your friendships. And as opposed to in the U.S. where he would have done 90% of his classes like virtually, mm -hmm. he actually got to be in school doing if he couldn't do things, we could go to the beach. We could go on a boat. We could enjoy the things in Bermuda that you couldn't do outside in the U.S., so it actually, I don't think it impacted him as much as many, but I also think that kids on the spectrum were also very much differently affected. I actually think they were less affected in some ways. And More internal. Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask you about you know, being on the spectrum and, and you being a physician, probably with very little nutritional training prior to your becoming who you are today. Yeah. Do you think that there's any 
possibility that him being on the spectrum could be related to any sort of dietary intake? I have no doubt. So we have done genetic testing, as all good Jews do, of course. And he and I are actually both missing a little bit of chromosome 11, which is associated with autism. I think I've got a little right here in case you need some. There you go. Fantastic. Yeah. And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. People at Boston Children keep looking. But I was a vegan for 37 years. Oh, dear. I know. Again, I couldn't cook and I was a vegan. It was awful. Were you a, were I, you a vegetarian prior to oh, that, being a vegan? Nope. Nope. Just went straight to vegan. Just straight to vegan. See, and... I've remained a vegetarian my entire life. <laughs> I guess uh, there are perks to it. But yeah, when I was pregnant, I was drinking soy and supplements and I wasn't getting the essential fatty vitamins. Of course, you always look back and you think, did what I did, what I was doing there, which I thought was the right thing. I thought it was the healthy thing I could do. Did that affect him in some way? Um, huge guilt complex with that. And when you look at the research studies, because a lot of the ketogenic studies for decades, I mean, actually going back to Hippocrates, like 461 BCE, it's how they treated epilepsy. A lot of the neurodegenerative diseases are treated specifically with 180 degrees from the diet I followed. And it's interesting, the more recent studies looking at the impact on brain health are so profound that we have actually sort of transitioned as a family. He is not fully ketogenic. We are not those kind of parents. And if, you know, if he wants pancakes, he can have pancakes. We're not those mm -hmm. parents. But we try to limit his processed foods. We try to limit artificial sweeteners, all the things that we can do now. And I mean, right now he's a 15 year old, so no offense. They're just weird as a species. Sure. 15 sure. year olds. So we, we try our best. We try our best. So now when you talk about a keto lifestyle and you talk about reversing disease and eliminating probable future disease, that's yes. not in all cases, but it is clear yeah. that they're utilizing keto and autophagy as methods to making sure that people live the healthiest life they can. Absolutely. Actually, I don't know if you've been following the news in just the past 48 hours. A study came out, uh, it wasn't huge. It was 12 patients who um, have IBD, so Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. They put them on a strict keto diet. Every single one of them had near complete reversal of their disease in a very short period of time. I believe it was three months. Amazing. Off medications yep. with near complete reversal of disease, gut health, as you know, incredibly important. But you're talking about disease that can absolutely be managed with diet. Right. And it's just, you know, I, I had an interesting conversation with a woman today that I was involved with this, doing a, another podcast. And she said she was on Wigovi after she had been in Zephyr. She failed as Epic after she failed her gastric bypass and failed, failed, and then failed Wigovi. And then she actually did well in Wigovi. And then her insurance stopped paying for it. She said she gained 40 pounds back. And she said she's actually heavier than she was before. And she goes, I don't know what to do. I failed all these things. And I said, well, how much time did your doctor talk to you about what you should be eating? She's like, well, you know, he said I should eat low carb. Uh, okay. That was it. <laughs> like, well, that's a giant step it. forward for most doctors. Right. Yeah. But that was it. So this is a woman for five years. Gastric bypass failed in her mind. It was epic. And then Wigovi. And then she can't take Wigovi anymore. She has no, she has no tools. And in her case, the tragedy is... She never probably would have had to have the gastric bypass if she had actually just learned some tools and nutritional tools, and she never did. Right. Instead of medicinal tools, which are not exactly. tools, they're crutches. And yes. crutches aren't tools, so there's a difference there. You think about it. I'm sure you're familiar with so the ADA, the American Diabetic Association, mm -hmm. who says you have to have carbs for energy, which is physiologically untrue. In fact, their current... I don't know her exact title. I don't know if she's the marketing director, but she used to be the marketing director for Kellogg's. 
Now she's the marketing director for the American Diabetic Association. Surely there's no conflict of interest, especially when they say cereal and bread is one of the healthiest things you can have as a diabetic. Oh, yeah. They get the heart healthy sticker if they pay enough Absolutely. money. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Millions of dollars. So yeah. certainly no, no conflicts there. Oh, no, of course not. Not in medicine and, and in big no. and big food. No, no, not at all. So this leads me to the question that's in the back of my mind. That's a faraway place. You're working within a system and you have mm-hmm. to work for the man or the men who run a corporate enterprise being an overnight ER doctor, how do they respond to Amy telling her patients, maybe, you know, their behaviors need to change and maybe they should explore keto and et cetera, et cetera, instead of Mm -hmm. just treating them, writing a prescription and saying goodbye. So it's an interesting dichotomy. So I love my job. I love emergency medicine. It's a very sort of uh, goldfishy type of job. It's for people who like, oh, write things and we have very little short attention spans. So I follow standard of care always. I would say in about those 85% of patients who come who are chronically ill, I try to have a conversation within the realm of, I get it, you're dying right now. Let me just, right now I have to kind of patch you. I can't fix you. It's very interesting. I have a TED Talk coming up, which is actually talking about how patient satisfaction scores harm patients. I, so I have two types of patients. I have patients who hate me and patients who love me. I follow the same standard of care for everyone. But the patients who don't like what I have to say and complain are patients who I like, I'm not giving you chronic opiates. Not, it's not standard of care. It's not acceptable. And guess what? If you come in here smoking, I'm going to talk to you about it, especially, especially if your kid's an asthmatic who's in there for an ear infection who can't breathe. A lot of times they'll say, well, I don't smoke in front of my kid. I smoke outside. I'm like, yeah, but I don't live with you. I can smell it. Right. Parents don't want to hear it. And I always tell them, I'm not telling you you're a bad parent. I am not saying that. I'm telling you, you need to be educated on the fact that just because you're smoking outside, which kudos, you're trying, but it's not helping. Right, right. The other patients who I think they're genuinely grateful that someone is talking to them. So I had a patient a point in the past six months who, and this is always HIPAA, of course, patient confidentiality, but they came in the blood sugar was sky high. And this is a patient who had been very, very well controlled, insulin dependent diabetic. Well, what changed? New doctor. Okay. New doctor. And he said, you know, I was really, really hungry. It wasn't getting enough fiber. So I could have up to six apples a day. Oh, my. Insulin dependent diabetic. She's Mm -hmm. like, well, he said, my doctor said it's good fiber and it's fruit. It's healthy. Six apples a day. Isn't it wild that doctors can make a distinction, an incorrect one? By saying that their patients can eat fruit and be okay, yes. and yet sugar is yes. not okay. The patient who reasonably was listening to what her doctor said, and I said, listen, this is, we need to talk. And ultimately grateful for the information, she was frustrated. And I said, I am not telling you, you have a bad doctor. Your doctor was trying to do something good for you. I'm just saying that we don't get a lot of nutritional information. In fact, not only did I get zero nutrition, you get, I said, no of mental health either. And that's, of course, you know, or substance abuse. We don't get any training. I think new curriculums have about eight hours. Not and, enough. Oh, gosh, no. And it's terrible training. It's terrible training. It's, you know, whole grains and high carbohydrates. It's the food pyramid, which is nonsensical uh, and paid for. And it's, you know, the testosterone levels of men have dropped so significantly over the past 70 years. Why? What do we do? We've taken fat out of the diet. We've bastardized cholesterol. We've taken red meat out of the diet. Well, what do you think is going to happen? We, if we cannot build ourselves with fat and cholesterol, we can't feed our brain. We can't feed our heart. It is an absolute travesty what these guidelines have done to the health of the population. 
I have a friend of mine who asked me, Matthew, how is it that you, you eat no fruit, you eat no processed foods, and like you eat mostly meat? Isn't that bad to eat mostly meat? I said, no, quite the opposite. You know, she just couldn't believe it. Everyone is so conditioned as to what we've all been sure. brought up with. Like you said, when you were a kid, margarine and breakfast cereal. So, Amy, I have you right where I want you. What have you eaten today? Oh, today? Well, I fast most days. So, my, because I'm a night shift, my yesterday's meal was I had some great duck eggs from the farmer's market that I got last week. So, I made some nice duck eggs with some fresh Amish butter, nice salted fresh Amish butter. And then we had gotten this, you're going to think, well, you're not going to think it's disgusting. Liver and beef hearts and a 70-30 mixture from our local butcher who grinds it himself. Nice. All mixed together, made the house really stinky and I loved it. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about sexy foods? So Yes, I do. Avocado. Do you know where the word avocado comes from? I came across this in my research. Wow, wow, wow. We'll lay it on me. So the Aztecs, the term for avocado is the same as their word for testicle. Okay, totally makes sense. And absolutely. Vitamin E, full of vitamin E, increases like the vascularity, blood flow to fingers, toes, and other places. But it also sort of, you know, looks like the wrinkly, crinkly bag of skin that it is. But Half an avocado every day. There you go. It's fantastic for your sexual vitality. Vitamin E right. and zinc, super healthy for you. But I, I came across that little nugget. I'm like, well, that's interesting. That they, people need to know this kind of stuff. And the, the eggs are fantastic, full of choline for your brain. Actually, you know, people who eat egg white omelets are just missing out on so much of the the healthy part of the egg, the cholesterol, which, as you know, is completely demonized. But we need it. We need it to build our cells and keep our neurons happy and our mitochondria, which, as every fifth grader knows, the powerhouse of the cell. You bet. You know, I've been on a keto-related lifestyle for quite a while. And every doctor I visit wants to give me statins because my cholesterol is high. And I said, Doc, here's some, here's some information you can read and let them know about, uh, you know, keto patients usually having higher cholesterol and it's yes. not unsafe and statins are truly unsafe. The, the data. So one of the first things when I was moving from, I become a pescatarian and I ultimately I had, had a sort of a horrible series of health crises and in desperation, stumbled upon carnivore diet, which I thought was ridiculous. I thought, I'm like, this is the silliest thing and it doesn't make any sense. It's completely unhealthy. And then I started doing research, like deep dive into the science behind it. I'm like, ah, this is, it actually makes sense. Mm -hmm. Statins were the first things that I came across. And I like physically, physically sick to my stomach realizing how bad these medications were. But not only that, the direct tie between statins and Alzheimer's, the type 3 diabetes, as we call mm -hmm. it. It just, Alzheimer's didn't exist, essentially, other than rare cases of dementia before statins. And now we have this entirely sick population where 85% of patients with Alzheimer's have diabetes. Well, why do you think? And everybody's right. on a statin. This is very interesting Twitter account from, it's called Perennial Pastors. And it is an owner of, a director of a series of uh, senior living houses. And he, essentially, they come into nursing home care. Some of them are completely debilitated. They face like they're not talking, they're not walking. They immediately do all their medications and then they put them on a ketogenic diet. And the he will post every week or so, hey, this is Bob. Bob came to us and he was like curled in the fetal position, hadn't moved for 10 years. And now Bob's in the kitchen making dinner. Right. Off all statins. I'm so glad you didn't give in to your doctors with those. They're very dangerous medications. Truly. You know, 
the medical system is just starting to get a glimpse of waking up. But because you're trapped inside this kind of corporate hierarchy, it's very difficult. And I'll tell you something interesting, Amy, that a lot of the people that I come in contact with are trained and educated in medicine and are now starting to go through this second cycle of their lifestyle and their careers. And they're, they're kind of moving away from medicine and into healing. And a lot of mm-hmm. it has to do with learning about the keto lifestyle, low carb lifestyle, things like that. So it's interesting how you say that they're moving away from medicine and moving towards healing. And I think that's a really profound statement in that I think a lot of us in medicine who truly love medicine and listen, I'm an emergency room physician. I, like I said, I heal boo-boos. I like the people I work with. I think we do really good work, but I don't really heal a lot of people. And I think no matter how jaded we get, most of us in medicine really wanted to make some sort of impact. And it is the rare night that I feel like I have walked away and I've made a particular difference. Not like, okay, I found your heart attack. I got you to a cath lab, but maybe I had that one person who went, Oh, that makes sense. And so I think that healing that you talk about is what a lot of clinicians are seeking. And it would be lovely if I had nothing to do except for, you know, people who got their arms cut off by a gator because they wanted to pet it as one does in Florida. Yeah, right. Where in Florida are you? I'm in Orlando, like right outside of Orlando and um, sort of makes me sad because I don't have an ocean by me. But right. it's a close drive. Well, you it's can make drive. changes, Amy. It's never too late. Come on. Come to the ocean. Here's the thing. We have found the most amazing school for my son. He is happy. We are happy. Right. It's a fantastic community. We literally, So we live in a little place called Winter Park. It is the most Norman Rockwellish place in the universe. We love our neighbors. We have a nice, safe place. He has a great school. So I don't live by the ocean. It's gotcha. Okay. It's okay. So you it's worth it. It's interesting. Uh, it's kind of an oxymoron living in Florida at, at a place called Winter Park, where you're always hoping I know. for some winter weather. You'll never it get was, it. Uh, it was founded by people from uh, upstate New York. Oh, really? Yeah. So you're surrounded by transplants from the Northeast because that's in the fine print. You know, everyone has to go down to Florida. I think there's a rule. If you come here, you have to be among the top 5% worst drivers wherever you've come from in the mm-hmm. world. And you come down to Orlando and then get on our highways. Uh, is I think, and I don't even think it's unwritten. I think it's you have to sign off on the fact that you must be a terrible driver from wherever you came from to come to Florida. I think it's part of part of the deal. So how do you deal with that? Uh-huh. We, we actually only have one car because when we moved to Bermuda, we walked everywhere, took the bus because everything's really quite close. And my husband is a nurse, but right now he is waiting for his son nursing license and he's a stay-at-home dad. We're very, very lucky. It's great very for my cool. son. Yeah. So he, he essentially is my, he's my Uber. <laughs> we, we have a really, really bright, vile colored green car, which is easy to see on the highway. And uh, he transports me to work and back and we try to avoid the highway. And in all honesty, there's very little traffic at four o'clock or five o'clock in the morning, sometimes when I get off work. So it makes it pretty easy. And kiddo is only 10 minutes down the road for his school. So it's pretty easy. Oh, gotcha. So you're you're overnight, what starts at 8 p.m. or something like that? Different shifts. Sometimes it's six to six. Sometimes it's uh, eight to nine, um, six to three, six to four. It's always different, but it's um, always night. Every now and again, I will like help someone out during a day, but I've worked nights for almost my entire career. There are night shift people and day shift people. Right. It is a little bit different personality. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you were a night owl before you started working nights, though. I was an EMT uh, fire rescue for a long time, and we'd work 24s, but primarily nights. Even 
when I was running my department, I was at a department chair for a while. I still work nights because Mm -hmm. it's just, you know, it's sort of my habit. For me though, now it lets me have a set schedule because otherwise you're rotating. It's really bad for your cortisol. Um, I'm in my fifties and it's, you do everything you can to keep that your cortisol level sort of normal. And plus I get to see my kiddo every morning. So I'm very happy about that. Oh, that is very cool. Now you were EMT some years back. Mm-hmm. So you were used to driving like a mad woman whenever Absolutely. necessary. And here right you down are, the middle of the road. You're being Ubered <laughs> by your by your Catholic Irish husband. I know. And, <laughs> I know. So that's kind of an interesting balance right there, isn't it? I learned how to drive in Connecticut where we had moved after we left Detroit and the roads are like this big. And so I learned how to drive driving an ambulance with a phone book because I'm kind of not tall right down the middle of the road. And it was sort of, I don't know that it was necessarily the best way how to learn how to drive, but it's how I did it. So being not tall, you're going to fit right into the the whole Floridian driving thing in 20, 30, 40 years from now. Right. Oh, exactly. yeah, absolutely. Oh, right, yeah. Right. This, <laughs> All I can see are arms from behind. It's um, you learn as you grow older, right? Whatever circumstances yeah. do I, I like I teach a whole lecture on something called flexible adaptability. It makes you a really good physician, but it's completely translatable across all things in life. Because so like I walk into work every night, I kind of expect the worst because that's how my nights go. But you never know what's coming in the door. You never know who you're going to work with. You, I mean, you generally have some of the same people and you never know what you have, what you need. What you, and so you have to be able to turn on a dime. So Sometimes you just go, okay, this is what I have. This is what I want. This is what I need. How do I make this all happen? And if it's in Florida, cool. If it's in Bermuda or on a ship, um, I've been really lucky to have all these kind of random jobs my entire life that have really helped me a lot because you learn better how to figure things out. So having all these random jobs as a physician, does that make you difficult to work with? I mean, is that what that tells me? Or does it tell me that you keep on searching and seeking? I don't know that I'm difficult to work with. I know that I, when people like throw things at my head when I walk into shift, because I tend to be a bit of a cloud. I have been a cloud from the first day of my first rotation uh, as an EMT at age 15. That was my first shift and it hasn't gotten any better since. So although I, um, I used to bribe people by bringing them food, like, I'm so sorry I'm here, but I tend to get along very well with people. We all have cranky moods as, as one does, but I have a complete wanderlust It's not that I'm ever satisfied. I love my job. I love the people I work with. Um, As frustrating as it is, because medicine is a different animal than it is, you know, than it was 20 years ago. But I'm always looking for something to maybe scratch that little itch. And, you know, I had my, my dream job was Bermuda. I waited years and years and years. It was perfect in every way except one. And my son wasn't getting everything he needed. He had a great school, but it wasn't everything he needed. Mm -hmm. So move on. You know, I was director for a while, loved it. Top pinnacle of my career. Things change a little bit, move on. And I think there, I believe it was 2020, there was a study that looked at new grants out of emergency medicine residency. And over the first 10 years, it was something like four jobs. Wow. Yeah. That makes sense. How many careers have you had in your life? At least a few from reading things on the, on the interweb. Yeah, definitely. A hundred. I'm stuck on something you said a few minutes ago. You are not so tall woman who used to bribe people with food. Who's a (laughs) self-professed non cook. Yes. I didn't cook. I didn't cook for them. So what'd you do? You pick them up food at Winchell's or something? Yeah, no, or Dunkin' Donuts. Oh, definitely, completely unhealthy food. Yeah, I would mm-hmm. go okay. and get cookies or donuts. 
Oh, absolutely. I've been known to make soup every now and again. And since I've become a carnivore, I have learned how to destroy pretty much every piece of meat. It has been a very expensive endeavor learning how to be a carnivore, no matter how many shows I watch. So I love Julia Child. I think, you know, fat is flavor. She's hysterical. But she's got like thousand, you know, I mean, it's not like cooking for the average person. So I try to like find like really simple things to do. And so like tonight we went to the um, butcher and he had some really pretty steaks that he had put aside. So he, and he goes, so this is what we're going to do. Like he was like writing out, like as an actual local butcher is great. And this is how to not destroy this beautiful piece of meat. I just told you. And so my husband will supervise Raised by an Irish Catholic mother, so he knows how to cook. Or does I, he? Yeah, he actually does. Uh-huh. He's a wonderful, he's a wonderful cook, actually. Um, and he gets very anxious when I'm in the kitchen. <laughs> Just, oh, he allows you in his kitchen. He's a good guy. Yeah, I don't, it makes him nervous. It's funny, though, because I'll be cutting something. He goes, be careful with the knife. I'm like, what do, I, what do I do for a living? What do I do for a living? Be careful. Be careful with the knife. Well, that's that's awful kind of him. You should let him know. Kudos. <laughs> I will let him know. Absolutely. There are some foolproof methods to cooking meat, so you don't have to be af- afraid of that. And, and I could help you guys with that anytime you want. And, I may ask. And since you're like a soup maker, you can make meat soup and you can be happy. But I can teach you to make any meat that you like to eat and have it be what you want it to taste like and what you want it to feel like in your mouth. That would be fantastic because I found the most wonderful company that makes the most amazing bone broth. And it's fun because when I destroy meat and I make it too tough, what I do is I put in my bone broth and then it makes it all so much better. So it tastes better, but does it help change Uh your texture? Mm. Does it? Does it? Maybe it's just in my mind, but yes. Okay. Here's a pompous chef's response to bone broth. Can't you just make it yourself since you know a butcher? Yeah. So I brought a, a, uh, what's an, is it an air fryer? Is it an air fryer? Uh It'll change your life. Yeah. It's really pretty. Oh yeah. We, we buy appliances because they're pretty. Yes. It is decorating just like a counter. Yeah. It makes not as much noise as a lot of women do. But Mm -hmm. here's the thing about an air fryer. They are really hard to clean. So I've used it twice and it is a beast to clean. Now, it did. It was really nice. We made some it like stew meat in it. Put Uh some nice uh, just a little just a little salt. Just like, oh, my gosh, it was fantastic. But I swear two days of soaking that guy on the counter just trying to like scrub it out. It was, it was a beast. Do you have any secrets to making that easier? I soak it. And then I, I mm-hmm. kind of get the crap off of the little tray, the yeah. um, perforated tray, whatever you call it, yeah. just a wood spoon or wood utensils. To yeah. Get, get it off of there. Yes. You can't really do much with a, an air fryer that you can't do with a cookie sheet and parchment paper right in your own oven without I've the mess and fuss. We got some of those silicone sheets as well. Sill pads. Uh, Sill pads, yes. Which has really helped with cooking some things because uh, like most uh, good Jews who are tattooed, uh, I've discovered bacon. Oh, God bless you. This is my bacon come to Jesus story, is, which is a weird thing to say. I consulted my dear friend, another physician. He is a Orthodox Jew. And I'm like, I'm having a lot of guilt because I'm, I'm really interested in this other meat source. I'm having a hard time getting as much fat in my diet as I'm trying to get into ketosis. I said, I'm really thinking about bacon, but I'm... He goes, so you're tattooed. Yes. You married an Irish Catholic. Yes. He goes, are there any of the 574 laws that you haven't broken yet? 
Not really. He Probably goes, not. He goes, let me tell you. Last Yom Kippur, he goes, I broke fast at a Korean hot pot. He goes, because he was at a conference. He goes, it was some of the best pork that I've ever eaten in my entire life. And he goes, I literally came from synagogue. He goes, get over yourself. I'm like, already then. It was like having having my own rabbi. Just thank you, sir, very much. Yeah. And from now that, that moment on. That is a blessing. It is. Yeah. Bacon is wonderful. It's oh, it is. Fantastic. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah. That, really that, good. That's quite often on the breakfast plate with the eggs and avocado. It's a sexy food. Tell us why, Amy. Oh, zinc, good mm-hmm. for those blood vessels, L-carnitine and arginine. Again, the precursors to a lot of the sexy foods plus A, D, E, and K, your fat soluble vitamins. It helps kind of make all those other processes work. So it makes your brain work better. It truly is a brain food. If you don't get the ones that are like soaked in sugar and um, like right. maple, maple, whatever. Anything because artificial color. Anything artificial. Yep. You know, it's it's crazy when they say, oh, no added whatever. And you look at the package and you're like, except for all the things that are added. I, right. I don't understand that. All. Well, they, they, it's their feed. Their feed contains all the crap, and, but then they, they don't add anything after that. Well, well, but right? other than the molasses, right? It, it's just so much crap when you take a look at, at the, the whole entire industry and, and people <laughs> and the labels and on and on and on. It's just like, where do you begin in, in being able to kind of figure it out? It's interesting. Let me ask you, because you are, you seem very, very dialed into your diet. And obviously, as a chef, you know all those secrets. If you go to a restaurant, I'm sure you all you know all the secrets that make things taste good in a restaurant. And if you don't eat something necessarily, like let's say you don't eat like an artificial whatever, and you are eating something and you do you have like a trigger that you like, oh, I know there's something in here that like... um a lot of like the whipped butter. I had no idea was like canola and those things. And I had been like really strict for a while. And then we had gone to rest. I'm like, oh, I'm going to have steak. And ooh, they have butter on the table. It's great. Let's make it. And I got home and I'm like, my head's going to explode. Something's wrong. I don't know what. And I had no idea. Do you have the same triggers at this point? After spending a lifetime of, of being a chef and cooking for celebs and uh, taking care of people to the excess, being the people pleasing person I am and mm-hmm. the excessive eater experience of my life, I am now a completely different person. And I know all the tricks and secrets and horrors that go on behind the scenes at restaurants. And I'm sure. unless they're a high end restaurant with the appropriate and proper ingredients, you're going to be getting a lot of crap in your food. And one thing that really is scary to me is knowing that the celestial seed oils, which are awful for your health, you could probably speak to that a little bit. They're everywhere. Everything that gets fried is getting fried in poison and people yes. are consuming it like it, there's no tomorrow. And industrial lubricant. There may not be it's a tomorrow. industrial lubricant. Okay. That's how it started off. If you knew what a canola seed or a sunflower or anything, what it had to go through to go from the crop to that bottle that never spoils in your pantry, you'd freak. I think pretty much every kid growing up has that one vegetable oil bottle that's at the back of the pantry that's been there since like, you know, the 60s. Oh, it's still, oh, it's still good. Well, gosh. It shouldn't be, should it? Yeah, and no, it's factory food. And, and factory so many, they have a fleet of scientists and biologists and, and chemists and all of those kinds of people, not chefs and cooks, uh, to be able to transfer that stuff from, from the ground to the industrial product it has become. They force feed us that at every single restaurant you'll ever go to. It's heart healthy. I mean, haven't that's, you heard? That's right. They have their stamp it's heart of healthy. approval. Yeah, nice Actually, mandates. I think the bottle that it's in is probably healthier than what it's contained within it, in all right. honesty. It's interesting, though, because it's essentially a food that came across as like, well, we have all these waste products. What do we do with it? And it's interesting to think what 
could have been done with it. But now this, you know, these cancers that are appearing, the the explosion of cancers, especially the bowel cancers in our under 40 set, what have they grown up with? Completely processed diets, artificial this, artificial this, but processed in seed oils. It, it's just the saddest thing because you can give people all the good data. You can show them all the good data and they still will not believe you. Right. Um, I'm curious though, if I could just ask a question, because you have had all these wonderful cooking experiences. Do you have that one meal that you had at that one place in that one, like the one that you say, this was the best meal I had in my entire life? Well, I'm curious. <laughs> I don't. But I have okay. a lot of I have a lot of meals that fit that kind of criteria that have been yes. like way up at the top, and they don't don't all have to do with taste, and they don't all have to do with uh, service, and they don't mm -hmm. all have to do with uh, experience. But it's some combination of those things that can make a great meal great. It could be the company, for instance. Sure. I've had great meals all the way from me cooking inside of a of a little hostel in Portugal. All the way on uh, up to to a now Michelin starred restaurant in in Barcelona. So, you know things like that. A meal mm -hmm. doesn't stand out for me. And I was a, I was a restaurant reviewer for many many years, and so it makes it that much more difficult because I sure. eat much much more food than most people. It's an interesting thing because it is. It's always the experience. It's not that one thing. I like food. to go out because. Yeah. I'm always going to have diner's remorse, meaning the food's not going to live up to what I can do or what my expectations are. Sure. But I like getting out of my own kitchen. I like being waited on and served. And I like the experience. Sure. And I like not having to clean up after myself and, and all of that <laughs> kind of thing. It's an interesting kind of transition or, or circular kind of motion that's taking place in the food world for me. Barcelona. It's on... We're going next year. It's on my, my, my bucket list. I'm very, very excited. Oh, you've not been yet? No, we are going next year. We're doing a transatlantic cruise, and that's one of the places that we get to go. Oh, great, great. So, well, you know... Have some good food. Now's the time. We need to check in and plug in with each other so we can make some reservations in advance because there some of these go. places will require that I've kind heard. of pre-planning. Yeah, yeah. I've heard. Absolutely. So yeah, it's weird to think a year in advance, but that's okay. It's worth it. I think the only place that I've ever been surprised that back when I was a, a vegan, I was speaking at a conference in Las Vegas and I had gotten like a speaker fee and they had given me like 500 bucks and they paid for my hotel and all that. So I had this 500 bucks. I'm like, Oh, what am I going to do? And I was at the Wynn and the concierge, I asked him, like, is there a place I can go and like get like, you know, a good like, vegan meal? He's like, well, you were at the Wynn, dear. This is like vegan heaven. And he said, oh, he goes, we have this chef's table. He goes, it's all vegan. He goes, only 12 people. We have 11 tonight. Would you be interested? Oh, yeah, that sounds great. How much? He goes, $750. <laughs> oh, dear God. <laughs> yeah, right, right. For one meal? And he's, yes. So I called my husband. I'm like, this is going to be the most ridiculous thing. Didn't have to ask permission, but I'm like, it's 12 people. He goes, you know what? Do it once. Oh, my Lord. I, I don't remember any specific thing we ate, but I remember the entire experience. It was magical, absolutely magical. And the only thing second to that, we used to live um, in New York by the CIA, and they had all the train the trainees at the CIA, and so we would go to Baku's, and it was such. Whatever we ate, it was always just such a service thing. And they made you feel like you were a celebrity. It was, it was magical. So that's cool that you have all those experiences too. I don't you know, suppose you can tell goal. me the famous people that you... Who is, the, who is the most fun person you've cooked for? Probably can't. Uh, 
Dan Aykroyd was fun. Robin Williams <gasps> was fun. I almost set his house on fire. Um, oh my Eagles, God. Fleetwood Mac, Pink Floyd, lots and lots of people. Is Robin Williams as kind in person as he seemed like he was? He seemed like he was kind. The comedians are really smart. and They have um, to be. Almost all of the ones that, that I've encountered, worked with, or worked for have been very kind and, you know, maybe switched off when the cameras are not rolling and that's sure. okay. And when I was working with them or in their kitchen, I felt like the cameras were rolling. So I was always on. And so sure. it was me being the person who's on that they could relax a little bit, let their hair down, yeah. which is great. It is sad how tortured he was. Mm -hmm. And I know, you know, his life is very, very difficult, but it's just sad that that had to happen. It's, you know, he, everybody knew, I mean, he had to drugs, he had recovered, he had done this. He just, his entire life is giving other people joy. And it's sad that he could not have that himself. Right. I think it's tragic, absolutely right. tragic. Oh, yeah. And it didn't have to be that way. But then again, it doesn't have to be that way for any person, yeah. celebrity, successful or otherwise, to do themselves in. So it's very difficult in this life when we're not connecting the way we sure. want to be. So it, sure. it happens at all levels. Yes. Yeah. A hundred percent. hundred percent. I want to get, I want to go back to what you were talking about a little bit earlier about the, uh, the keto sexy foods and the, all the various different ingredients and healthy sure. elements to those foods. Are they different than the chemical manufacturers who create supplements that people are swallowing by the dozen every Absolutely. single day? Yeah. So and first so, of all, you have, yeah, you have no idea what's in those supplements. They're right. completely unregulated. And it's, so there is no lab on the planet that can mimic a natural compound. Just, they can't. And anyone who says they get, and you always say, oh, this is the closest to nature you're going to get. Well, it's, but it's not nature. Have something in nature. It's so much easier. Now, there are some things you can't get in nature. There are things that are, you know, not so much artificial, but like, for example, um, DHEA. So uh, I will mangle it if I try to say it. It is a hormone, which is important for sex hormone generation, but it's not one of those that you're necessarily going to find in food, it's made in your body, but mm -hmm. you can get a supplement. Well, you can toss it at your adrenal glands all you want. It, it doesn't mean it's going to necessarily work. So you can take all these different kind of compounds, like for example, vitamin D. About 45% of Americans and more percent of women are vitamin D deficient. So I'll just take vitamin D. But unless you have magnesium and calcium and, oh, by the way, your kidneys and liver have to work too. And, oh, by the way, it's chelated, which means your body doesn't break it down. And now you're going to get kidney stones. Well, why don't you just go have a piece of red meat? It's just anything you take in a bottle. Why don't you just have a food where you can naturally ingest it in a form that your body recognizes? They did a study a number of years ago on Centrum vitamins. I looked and said, of all the things listed, how close are they, the percentages? And it went from zero to like, I think, three or 400 times what was represented in that bottle. You don't know what's in it. There's no right. regulation. Or it might be from China. A lot of these tablets come from overseas. And a lot of these things come from overseas. They're not regulated. There's no quality control. So if you can... Have a steak, an egg, maybe some fatty fish, some avocados, some nuts and seeds, some if you happen to be. Why wouldn't you? Because that contains everything you need nutritionally to keep all of this working. Mm -hmm. There's no reason to have anything for a bottle. Now, but if you have oysters, eggs, salmon, um, mackerel, I know people don't like anchovies. I don't know why. They're amazing. Anchovies are some of the healthiest foods that you can have. They're incredibly good for your bones, your joints, your skin, um, your 
of your sex hormones. They're wonderful right. for those. Right. Are you talking about the ones that are hand and salted or jarred and salted? Or are you talking about fresh anchovies that have been in grilled? Both. Okay. Both. Grilled fresh anchovies are, yeah, grilled anchovies. Mm. Yeah. They are fantastic. I'm like, I'm drooling just a little bit. When you get bit. over to Europe, you get the hell off of that cruise ship where they're going to be serving you whatever. Yeah. The, I know. Eat the, eat the local foods as much as you can. We like cruising because it gives us a little taster of all really cool places. And then when we find what we like, we go back. That's how we ended up in Bermuda. Um, a friend of mine for many, many years kept telling me, Matt, you got to go on a cruise. You uh, only have to unpack once and you can eat all the time, 24 hours a day. And I said, unpacking's not a problem for me. And as yes. you can tell... I can eat anytime I want now. <laughs> so cruising has never been a part of my, my travel go-to style at all. We enjoy it. It is one of those uh -huh. things we love as a family. And it was, for me, a way of shutting off because I wouldn't shut off otherwise. I would be like working or email or phone. And I found that it's less the destination and more the fact that we could just kind of do our family time for a little bit. So it's, it's very, very fun. Okay. I, I just got to ask you, what about being surrounded by a thousand Americans who are there maybe to drink and get high and, and do whatever they're going to do on board a ship? Maybe. I live in Orlando and I tend to be surrounded by thousands of people who are wearing ill-fitting clothes who are there to drink and smoke and be merry. Yes, there is You that. can deal with that. You're able I to can. deal with that. I can't. I I'm, I'm old. <laughs> I can't do well, that. I highly, I highly recommend this. Be a little bougie. I have gotten to the point in my life where I would rather work a few extra shifts to be a little bougie and we get ourselves a suite. I know, I know. But it is really nice to have a balcony. And there are times where we will get on a ship and I will not leave that balcony all freaking day, with the exception of going to the quizzes. Mm -hmm. We are pretty aggressive cruise quiz people. We, I don't even know what that is. It's like quiz night. When you go to quiz night and like trivia, Oh, you, okay. you, um, it's usually us fighting it out with the 80 year olds and we will take them down. We will show no mercy as a family. Mm -hmm. I do all the medical science. My husband does all the esoteric, ridiculous stuff like John Wick movies and stuff like that. Okay. My son does all the pop culture. So we are a formidable team. I wanted to ask you how you came up with the name Tough Love MD. I guess that's what you do on the side, yeah? It's my side. That's my, it's uh, primarily lecturing and things so I can have a kind of bigger audience. Uh, are you doing that in person or are you doing it here like this on the Zoom? Some like this and then conferences. And then I have some little small groups that it's not a clinical practice at this point because one has a mortgage and all that. But it came out of the fact that I started talking to patients and I was got so excited when somebody was like, oh my gosh, they're listening. And so frustrated by people who didn't. I'm like, it comes down to kind lies or unpleasant truths. I truly think... People, physicians are incredibly paternalistic or maternalistic and say, well, they really, I don't want to hurt their feelings. I'm going to, you know, I sure I told them smoking's bad, but they can't stop. So we'll just do whatever. Uh-uh. Patients are worth more than that. They're worthy. If, you know, every 350 pound person who came to the emergency department with uncontrolled diabetes who smoked, if someone had taken 15 minutes, sat down with them and said, listen, you don't have to live like this. You hurt every day. Your right. kidneys are going to fail. Your blood pressure is sky high. You are possibly infertile. You, you don't have to live like this. You're better than that. You are worthy. But I think physicians are afraid of, oh, I don't want to offend them. I don't. Want, uh, uh. Patients need some tough love. 
I'm not mean. I'm blunt, but empathetically so, because I truly want patients to understand that they are not destined for anything. People say, oh, I'm destined. My mother is fat. My father is fat. I'm fat. Everybody smokes. I can't. No, you are you. Today's a different day. Why don't we just, let's just start. And I I was saying to somebody, I'm like, I'm like they, people need tough love. And my husband's like, well, you need tough love MD. I'm like, that sounds like something that I could trademark, which I did. You got to, you got to do the business stuff, right? But, oh yeah. The business stuff. Yeah, is very business important. Stuff. Yes. But that's what it grew out of. And I found it more interesting to speak at conferences on improving your health versus, you know, teaching a slide set on it, click, 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 you know, all the <laughs> right. medicine stuff. So as far as your speaking goes, your TEDx's and otherwise, do you belong to a speaker's bureau or how does that whole thing work of getting booked before no. in front of people? I'm very new to this. This has been mm-hmm. um, about six months of sort of sitting down and going, hmm. And it came out of someone had seen me on LinkedIn and they said, hey, we need a speaker for Saturday in Orlando. We had somebody drop out. Would you be available? I said, oh, I'm sorry. I'm working nights. And they're like, it's five grand. And I'm like, um, I'm sorry, what? Because I'm used to speaking at EMS conferences where, you know, you get a sandwich, which is cool. And maybe uh, a plate of rubber I chicken. Uh-huh. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And so I ended up finding them a speaker. I still couldn't do it. I was working a shift, but I was so intrigued. And I said, well, let me put you in contact with a couple of people and ended up learning how to go from giving a speech to giving a talk. Mm-hmm. Very different things. Very frustrating. Very humbling. And so I've kind of transitioned over that time. I don't belong to a bureau. It's a very frustrating thing in that you need to have video to get video. You need to right. be, have a website to have. So trying to build all these things piece by piece and meeting really cool people. If you had told me six months ago, I'd be doing at least one or two podcasts a week. I'd be like, you, that's for like millennials or Gen Z or whomever. But I've met the nicest people, the most interesting people. And it's a really cool way of sometimes talking about science, sometimes not talking about science, uh, always being a little bit surprised and reaching out and saying, hey, this looks really interesting. It's not like my usual thing, but it looks interesting. Cool. Because every opportunity is the next opportunity to like, oh, maybe somebody hears this who would be really interested in me you know, being flown on their corporate jet to, you know, Hawaii. Mm-hmm. You, know, you never, never know. Private chef to yeah. cook me a nice steak with some nice butter. Those things happen. When I was doing Love Life Radio Network, I had a side business called Great Interviews. And I teach people, authors mostly, how to be a good interviewee. And, Interesting. and for people who are speakers, who are but, budding speakers uh, like yourself on, on how to address people and how to turn it into more what I would call conversational than speech or talk. So, sure. so, you know, we should probably work together in the future. I would love that. It would, in fact, it's been great because every podcast I've been on, the person interviewing is like, hey, I could help you with this, mm-hmm. which I think. The, the generosity of spirit by kind of everyone I've met in this business so far has been incredible. Like one of the first persons I did a podcast with, a super nice guy, his name is Rick Newski. He's like, all right, let me tell you everything that you are doing wrong right now and things that you need. He goes, you need an Ethernet cable. I'm like, I need a pen. What's Ethernet? I don't know what you're saying to me. <laughs> and it's uh-huh. like, and... It's been such a really lovely experience where I haven't necessarily had that in other speaking jobs. Not that they're better or worse. So it's been really interesting. And as I kind of grow, I'm trying to... It Honestly, the hardest part has been learning how to put on makeup, which I am 
useless at. It takes me like an hour to figure it out. And walking in anything but sneakers. It's been it's been very challenging. <laughs> you got to do more of these kind of talks. Yes. And I find it really, really satisfying. So hoping to do a lot more of that too. And again, you know, the private jet wouldn't hurt. That'll although come. I, I So Amy, being an overnight ER physician makes you kind of a tough chick because you got to handle stuff that's happening. It's an emergency thing. You were an EMT prior to that, but now you're like not doing either one of those things at this moment. At this moment. Have you always been a balabusta? Yes. Have you always been a mensch? Yes. Yes. So some things never change. Oh gosh, no. So then, not at all. How, how do you get along with with folks in your world? Do you have a social circle that you're able to deal with, or has that become more difficult in the post COVID years? I've never been a terribly, terribly social person. I, I've always liked people. Fire department. All my friends are cops and firefighters, and um, night shift makes it exceedingly difficult to have any sort of social life. Um, because when I'm not sleeping, I'm up at night. I find my social circle, like many people who work in a hospital, tends to be other people who work in the hospital or the fire department or other nurses, which is fine. I think it's great. A lot of people that we work with actually have normal people in their life. So I'm always fascinated when you have like a nurse or a doctor who has married a a normal human being. I'm like, oh, What's that like? What do you talk about? (laughs) I'm very content when I come home. I have my kiddo. We enjoy each other's company. I go to the gym. I do my walks. I enjoy those things. And every now and again, get to go out and have a nice cup of coffee with somebody and have a good time. Because you're you're dealing in an ER so often and people, they're gunshot victims and car crash victims and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. How do you get off shift and be able to manage the stress that you just went through prior? Sometimes good, sometimes bad. It is when my husband and I actually used to work together. That's how we met each other, uh, obviously, in the hospital. And you sort of have to have a rule that you're going to say, like, it's 15 minutes. We get 15 minutes to talk, and then we got to move on. And you don't really move on, per se. You shouldn't bury it. But I think acknowledging the fact that you are a human and these things are very, very difficult. And the things we see on a nightly basis are often very unhuman or inhuman. I am as surprised by human kindness as I am by not human kindness. Time at work, I think absolutely nothing could top this. Something does because that's my job. And we just sometimes you go home and I think it makes you appreciate Every minute, Mm -hmm. because every single person I saw in the emergency department who's having a crisis, when they left their house that morning and kissed their family, they didn't know it was the last time. Nobody knows. They didn't know that, oh, maybe that little stomach ache that I have is metastatic cancer. You know, people don't know. So I think it makes you appreciate those things that other people, because they don't have those experiences don't hold very dear to themselves. And I do, you never let them, you never go to bed without saying, I love you. You just don't. It's just, you never know. You don't want to miss those things. Right. Right. So your usual bedtime is probably now like during the day. Yeah. Yeah. I get, I usually, I get off work. I eat, uh, do a little something, something, get my walk. Sometimes I go to CrossFit if I'm feeling particularly like I want to get beaten up, uh, yeah. get off to school, and then I go to bed. And on nights that I'm not working, I try to keep the same schedule because otherwise you, you know, you get out of habits. Right. You were able to choose your future. Mm-hmm. Money was no object. I know you love to help Ooh. people. It's obvious because people would not get into your line of work if they didn't love to help. Would you choose to continue to do that? Or would you choose something different? Would you be a sculptor? Would you be a writer? Would you be a, an Olympic swimmer or weightlifter? What would you choose to do? 
I have no skills whatsoever. Uh, I'm really bad at pretty much everything. I enjoy things like I'm a horrible singer and I really like it. I'm a horrible dancer. I enjoy it. But I've always wanted, I, I did a very short stint on a cruise ship during one of my little midlife crises. I loved it. You work every day. It's incredibly hard, but you're away from your family. So it'd be lovely to have a nice combination job where you could be on a ship with your family, travel the world, see a little bit of the world, stop off in Barcelona and give a nice conference lecture. The problem is when you have, you know, parents and families and things like that, that makes it very difficult. But yeah, I'm, I, I don't know that I could be a kept woman, although I could try for a little bit. I haven't had... 12 careers necessarily. I've had some weird ones, but yeah. they've, they tend to be all centered around medicine in some way. Yeah. Yeah. I cleaned grease at a ball bearing factory uh, one summer, the machines. I cleaned the grease every night. You'd go and scrape the grease, clean the machines. And you'd have a beautiful looking machine and you came back the next night and did it again. And it was very satisfying And at the same time, incredibly sad because there were people that have been doing that for 15 years. That was their job. Right. They were, that's what they were going to do. You were cleaning grease in a ball bearing factory and yet you can't clean an air fryer. Uh, No, maybe it's I won't clean the air fryer. Uh, Okay. I I can see you in the backyard sandblasting your air fryer. Yes. I was much younger then. I don't know. I shouldn't give excuses. I am tough love MD, so I shouldn't give excuses. Yeah, you're not tough love singer and dancer. No. Right. No, but I've passed on my joy of uh, singing and dancing to my kiddo who just, he is an 80s child, 90s child, loves it. He just, he's like, if MTV was still MTV, he would be glued to the television every day. He loves mm. it. I think it's mm-hmm. fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's very cool that he's enjoying himself. Yes. He's great. What is some of the, the most prevalent emergency factors and why you'll see someone in your overnights inside the ER? Number one cause, believe it or not, is back pain. Traditionally, um, that, that we brings see them to an pain. ER. Back pain. Oh, Oh, yeah. Like cramping, like I can't move, kind can't breathe type of back Or, oh, my back's hurt for 20 years. And what's different? I always ask patients, what's different today? Oh, it just hurts. All right. Well, okay. So and people so use back the ER in, in place of, of seeing a regular doctor because of Absolutely. some sort of weird rule? And what is that? Yeah. Is that about insurance or everything being covered by the state? Or how does that work? So there's many, many different reasons. There's a lot of socioeconomics, but it's, uh, as you know, I don't know, when's the last time you tried to get an appointment with your primary care? Two years ago and ended up seeing that person a few months back. There you go. Yeah. It is really hard, right? So you're like, oh, my back hurts. You call your primary care. Can I get an appointment? Sure. We have one in three months. Well, that's not helpful. Uh, Emergency department, we have something called EMTALA, which means we do not turn you away. Doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, what language you speak, insurance, no insurance, everyone gets a medical screening exam. Now, it's not free. People, there's a myth. People are like, oh, it's free because they don't collect any money. No, no, no. It's not free, but we see everyone. Uh, And you may have to wait a little bit depending on how busy it is, but you are seen. You show up. My toe has been hurting since 1972. Cool. Come on back. You may have to wait a little bit. Like wait a few hours, not a few months. Exactly. Exactly. And we try to get people in fairly quickly. But back pain's common. Chest pain, short of breath. I have a fever. The number of patients who come in who want uh, STD testing is always puzzling to me. Like what is happening at 2 o'clock in the morning that we're having an emergency STD test? Although a lot of people are like, oh, I wanted to come in because they didn't think it would be busy. Well... You are wrong, but come on back. We'll take a look. In the old days, two in the morning wasn't so late. In the old days, it wasn't. No, but yes, people come in, uh, they want to deliver their babies. We do not like doing that. A universal truth amongst all emergency room physicians is we do not like delivering babies. Oh, is that right? Are there specialists for that on the floor or is everyone trained to do that? Oh, we can. I've delivered 
probably hundreds of babies in my career. We just hate it. It's just, hmm. whereas upstairs, they're like, fine, whatever. Like upstairs is OB. You wheelchair up as fast right. as you can. But, and to them, like for me, it's like, oh, all right, gun to the chest, fine, whatever. And they're like, someone having a baby that's kind of fine whatever and we're like ah no not my idea it just so i don't know if this fits into keto or not but has anyone ever come in had a baby and and said before you induce them uh that, mm -hmm. that they'd like you to save the placenta because they want to have it as a snack afterwards so yeah we don't induce people in the emergency department it goes back to the we don't want to deliver you However, um, I know a lot of people who keep it and they powder it and they put it in like shakes and things, or they want to keep it for like genetic testing, or they want to bury it. There's even, and you'll have to excuse me, I don't know the right term. There's people who will keep it attached because there's some sort of thing about that. I don't honestly understand. That um, one I've never heard. No, it's a thing, apparently. I would Google it, but I don't feel I can do that and talk at the same time. But I I know many people who keep the placenta and get it powdered and they put it in their shake, which, I mean, that's what animals do in nature. It's a good source of iron. It seems kind of icky to me, right. but far be it from me. Yeah, I just, hmm, mine, mine went away with the child. It's fine. It's all good. Happy, happy, happy. <laughs> no, no shakes. It's okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you were done. You were done at that I point. I was quite done. Yes. Very happy, but quite done. Do you have any tips or tricks that you would suggest to the hopefully incoming administration as to how you could fix healthcare? I love the idea of make America healthy again. Now that tends to, I guess it triggers some people and that's fine. But I love the idea of investigating the FDA, investigating the pharmaceutical companies, making people like the AHA and the ADA, not just stamp of approval because someone gave you $2 million, but does it mean something? Making our food systems healthier, honoring the farmers instead of subsidizing all this other stuff. I'm intrigued. For the first time in a very long time, I think there is change in the wind. What do you think? What is your take on it? I think we're effed in many ways. Hopefully the, the good parts of AI will allow technologists, researchers, mm -hmm. and physicians like yourself to make smarter, faster, and more accurate observations of their patients. And sure. hopefully the price of medications will come down and Mark Cuban will continue doing his thing by fighting big pharma and things like that. Are you aware? Absolutely. He's, he's an interesting character too, because mm -hmm. when I had heard that, I didn't know where it was coming from because he doesn't seem like a businessman and he seems like a hard businessman like where is this coming from that he wants to do this because it didn't seem like it was like a goodness of the heart kind of thing but he seems very like hey people need these meds let's forget about the price gouging i think it would be even better if it were hey maybe we can get people off the meds but until that time i think it's really really important and I think if you take all the government regulation away from it, I think the market is going to settle for itself. Um, and it, again, it doesn't matter what side of the political spectrum you're on. I think everybody realizes that the more government involvement in it, the higher our prices are going to be for these things. Yeah, but not when you have corrupt families and the Shrekleys yes. and, and, uh, and people who are involved in, in the, in the opiates and stuff. I mean, right. this, this is a profit center. Like you can never believe. Absolutely. Absolutely. In so, fact, yeah. there was a thing I want to say, it came out, oh gosh, about two or three years ago, pediatricians who were vaccinated it had to be, I think like 60% of the pediatric population got a $40,000 bonus from and I, I apologize, I don't know which of the COVID vaccine companies it was. $40,000 bonus if they could vaccinate up to 60% of the population. Mm -hmm. It just seems to me, just saying that, 
tells you that there's maybe something not quite right about the way we're doing things. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. This Same. is a, a, a strange situation. Did you know that there were only two countries in the entire world that allow for pharmaceutical advertising on television? Us in Australia, right? Uh, New Zealand New, and New Zealand. US. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, right there, I think that that tells you something that it you know, is. is. It's a big profit center. And I think that they, they could take that away. My latest kick is suggesting that the United States takes one day's worth of defense budget and sprinkles it around a little bit and where they can feed, house, clothe, and take care of the entire world's population for an entire year. One day. Right. One day budget. So right. Why not? Why not try some things like that? You don't hear anybody talking about that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I think there are more people talking about it. We just don't hear their voices because mm -hmm. it kind of drowned out. But you and know how I whistleblowers think, get treated. Yes. We all know how that happens. And it's a really interesting thing. So when I like discovered ketogenics, I'm like, I'm well read. I study all the time. Why do I not know this? How do I not know this? But multiply that for the average person. Mm -hmm. How are they supposed to understand what is good information, accurate information? Because those voices aren't the ones that you're going to hear. They're not, you know, the thought leaders or whatever they are. And, you know, someone was saying, you know, in a very suit, like from, for example, Hawaii, with the fires that they had, one day of the budget for the military overseas, what were given to other countries, would have rebuilt the entire area of Hawaii that was devastated by the wildfires. It's an entire generation gone. Mm -hmm. And to see that it's really kind of ignored by our government, these are our citizens. Amy, is there anything that I haven't asked you that you'd like to put out there. But. This was so much fun. It was completely unexpected. I was like, I'm going to talk about like androgens and I like doing all the prep. No, you were absolutely delightful. I think we covered like Irish Catholic husband, incredibly cool child speaking, emergency medicine, little politics, good food, cruise ships, how good terrible of a dancer. Yeah. Terrible of it, a dancer I am. Still working up there for you. Ketones. Ketones. Saying. Excellent. Good for <laughs> you. No, I really appreciate it. You have been absolutely lovely. And I will absolutely take you up on some of the cooking because I would like to be a better cook. Was I the easiest show for absolutely. you to ever get on? I mean, we did back and forth and negotiate it all. You just said, I'd it like was, to come on. And I said, do it. Do it. Absolutely. And I think, I think your only question was, do you know what kind of show I have? I'm like, yeah, it's about cooking, which I don't know anything about, but hey, it's nutrition. So no, and you were absolutely lovely. So I can't thank you enough. This was a wonderful, wonderful experience. It's been fun for me too. And you know, what's funny is that people think that my show is about cooking and it's not, it's food forward, food, of course. Food, but yeah. if you, if you watch the channel, you'll see a lot of really fascinating conversation in all realms. Yeah, it's wonderful. And that's what when you've lived a very interesting life, you can have those conversations. So you and your businesses and careers that you've had, I think that's great. Right, right. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Thank on 50 you. Tastes of Grey. Now I'm going to get down to business and do some uh, hardcore editing because I too have Ethernet, just like you. <gasps> I know it's a special plug I have. So it's it's, I feel very accomplished as like a, a mid fifties. I don't know what generation we are, whatever generation the mid fifties is. Now I have an ethernet cable and a headset. I, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I look forward to seeing the finished product. You bet. It'll be a lot of fun, I'm sure. And, uh, thanks for hanging out with me for a little while, Amy. I really appreciate you Absolutely. and aloha. aloha. <laughs> have a good one. Thank you so much.